let's recall that till now we have been working on discrete spectra and spaces spanned by the eigenvectors of these observables were finite dimensional. The simplest is spin one half, of course, and the space is two dimensional. And there are, depending on which observable you are choosing, always two linearly independent vector which is spanning this vector space or any arbitrary vector in this space can be expanded in terms of these finite number of basis vectors, unit vectors. Now, when you have a continuous spectrum, I don't like the notation in this book, but anyway, still let me use it. He says, instead of eigenvalue equations of this form, in which I are really these type of integers, and it runs usually up to a capital N, Therefore, the space is also finite dimensional, whereas we may have now, instead, we will have expressions of the following form. operator and these are continuous variables so these vectors based on continuum nature of the spectrum are in principle infinite dimensional and therefore uh, the most of the theorems associated with linear vector spaces like these can be generalized but with some difficulty obviously we are not we will not be involved with those diffic mathematical difficulties we are not going to give existence theorems or stuff like that we'll assume that most of the things we said are valid uh, particularly in relation with the expansion postulate an arbitrary vector of this space being spanned by this <laughs> eigenvectors is still valid. But questions like orthonormality and completeness should be re-expressed in the new form. If this new operator now is also a Hermitian operator with the continuous spectrum, examples being position operator, momentum operator, and anything which could be derived from them. So when you really think of the explicit examples, it's easy to sort of feel it because we are so much used to it from classical, uh, classical physics. Therefore, uh, but having an infinite dimensional space offers several difficulties. Convergence of these expansions is also not that trivial to discuss. We will sweep all those complications, mathematical complications, associated with the infinite dimension of the spaces under the rug, and we'll carry over almost everything formally to this continuum region. Space is infinite dimensional, however, that's something to be kept in mind. <clears throat> Let's see how we do, how do we carry over <coughs> orthonormality of Hermitian operators, for instance. Orthonormality from discrete to continuum. Remember, orthonormality for a basis AI, in the discrete case, read this. It is carried over now to C 
prime delta C minus C prime. The Kronecker delta is replaced by the Dirac delta. And the completeness, suppose that all these are associated with a Hermitian observable A, and it's, I'm talking about its eigenvectors. I know that its eigenvalues are real in this case. And all the completeness read for the discrete case As such, and in the continuum case, it reads the C, C identity. Notice that I'm not going into really rigorous mathematical definition and subtleties associated with it, etc., etc. We are just transposing things we know from the discrete in the discrete sector to the continuum sector. So what about the expansion postulate, which was at the heart of the quantum theory till now, an arbitrary state vector in the cat space was written with the help of completeness in terms of this AI basis, say, which further read I, A, I, this is the coordinate, this was the coordinate, right? Expansion coordinate, expansion coefficient or the coordinate of that arbitrary vector in the A, I basis. And in this case now, in the <coughs> continuum, again you insert the completeness as far as that a approach is concerned, nothing changes. Changes were done in notation as depicted in those notations, but you just take this completeness and insert in here. And this becomes the coefficient, right? So the C, C, and C alpha coordinates in the C basis. Those Cs, which are eigenvectors of the Hermitian operator for the continuous case, are the eigen just basis vectors. Normalized in this manner, satisfying this completeness relation in the entire minus infinity to plus infinity spectrum, in principle. The spectrum, what are the number of points between 0 and 1? In the, on the continuous axis, it's already infinite, right? The Dedekind's are uh, axiom, uncountable number of points in the unit interval and between minus infinity and plus infinity. So that's the definition <coughs> of continuum. The smaller the interval gets, still the number of points you insert in here are infinitely many and uncountably many. And <coughs> If you would like to give a meaning to this coefficient, how do you determine it? By, uh, this is all definition is already in here, right? So what is the meaning of this? When you subject the system to a measurement, whatever the C is, it could be position and momentum and other things, or energy in the continuous, it's free particle energy continuous, right? And so it is the probability amplitude of finding the alpha in this particular eigenvector. Probability amplitude. And probability, that is this. If this is a complete sum in principle contains all the information contained in the alpha, this infinite sum, then whenever you carry out a measurement, you will get one of these infinitely many C values as a result of the capital C operator measurement. Therefore, the sum of all the overall the options should add up to one. That's the 
normalization condition, right? D xi xi alpha squared is 1. Think of it in terms of the Stengerda, the two-dimensional space. It, it was easy, right? Either spin-up orientation or spin-down orientation or splitting the unpolarized beam into two possible beams, two possible pathways in quantum mechanics. Then what was the probability of getting the up projection? It was the state projected along that up unit vector mod squared. What is the total probability? Uh, it was sum over to two options. It was adding up to one. Here, being continuous complicates, seemingly complicates, but as we are so much used to position and momentum from classical mechanics at least, we'll overcome those conceptual or philosoph philosophical difficulties. So we are more familiar with these continuous variables than the discrete spin, because spin has no classical counterpart. If you don't move into quantum mechanics, however simple that two-dimensional vector space is, we don't know much about it vis-a-vis -vis the classical region. In the classical region, we are used to these infinite continuous spectra. Okay, so be, relax a little bit. Don't, don't be afraid of these notations. It's, it's, it will be okay, really. And now, how about the inner product of two state vectors? in this context, then we have <coughs> <coughs> inner product of two arbitrary state vectors like this. We associate a complex number of this sort as, as satisfying the basic <coughs> axioms of the uh, inner product that is alpha and alpha, which is nothing but the length of that cat vector squared, is positive definite zero only in the case that the vector is itself null, or this alpha beta, or beta alpha is alpha beta complex conjugate, that's the second axiom. As far as those axioms are concerned, they are still valid because they are representation independent. Here, we are sort of talking about the representation because the new, the new basis vectors that we introduce into the system are associated with certain operators whose spectra are continuous, that's all. And that's in relation with the representation, really. Uh, apart from that representation thing, and as far as the abstract nature of the vector space is concerned, everything is the same, all the axioms are the same, apart from the fact that now the vector space is infinite dimensional, therefore it, ha it goes with the special name of Hilbert space. Sometimes we mistakenly, at least I can talk for myself, I tend to call all the linear vector spaces of quantum mechanics Hilbert space. It's not the case. Hilbert space is the infinite dimensional one, and all the finite dimensional ones are ordinary vector spaces, right? More well, finite dimension. Now, how do we <coughs> express this in terms of the coordinates? If there was a discrete spectrum, Remember, we, we do the following trick, trick for the discrete spectrum. We pick this basis associated with the observable A and insert N, then get the following expression, right? I beta AI and AI alpha, if you want, change it to AI beta star. So do you have expressions like that in the discrete case? What do you do in the continuum case? Just insert the counterpart of this for the continuous basis vectors, which is <coughs> the xi, xi, xi. Xi is associated with this xi operator. Think of it as x or px or p1. I guess that's understood, right? Yeah. Then what do we have? Beta alpha is d c. <coughs> beta x c beta star x c alpha. So what, that's what you get. These are is really the coordinates of alpha and beta in the c basis. And notice the complex conjugation how it enters. 
the left factors coordinate enters. Well, it was beta C. I used the axiom and converted it to C beta star. Therefore, that's the complex nature of the scalar product. If it is, if I denote those as alpha C, you are more familiar when I, you replace them with the psi, psi C, psi of X. You know, in the old conventional language, Sakurai has this, unfortunately, this unortho <laughs> unorthodox notation or language, alpha beta. I, I feel myself a bit uncomfortable, but anyway, that's the book, and we stick to the notation, and that is beta star C, or psi C, phi C, etc. So that's the the, the inner product in this new notation. And what about the mat matrix representation? Remember, in the discrete case, when we have this A, which, have, which is known to have complete orthonormal discrete basis, AI and NJ, and the matrix representation in its own eigenvector basis, in its diagonalizing basis. That's the, we have been talking about this diagonalization procedure in detail. So it is AI delta IJ. What if what is the counterpart of this in for this C operator? Think of it X or PX. <laughs> so what do I have? I have C C operator. C prime, C prime. When I go to XPX language, I will invent a new notation. I will use the capital X for the operator, little, little, little x for the eigenvalue and eigenvector. The same for the momentum, but here, this is the generic notation. I'm still sticking to the Sakurai. So I put an OP, not to get confused. OP means operator, and without the OP label, they are the numbers, which are eigenvalues or eigenvectors, okay. So C prime comes out using the eigenvalue equation, and you have C, C prime, and that's the Dirac delta, which mimics the Kronecker delta in here. Well, I'm aware of the difficulty associated with the Dirac delta, so I'm sure you do as well. Well, this has a well-defined meaning, right? When i and j is equal to one, itself, it is one. When it's, uh, not, they're not equal to, they are zero. So ones and zeros you are talking about. Here, you talk about zeros and infinites. Because when c and c prime are the same, you have infinity, right? So in a sense, there is such a sharp peak as far as defining the position location of an object and you have to think of Dirac deltas on the X spectrum when it's known to be there. Or you can smooth it out by with a Gaussian eventually to go through a Dirac delta limit, but picturing it is difficult. That's the warning I'm coming up. I'm trying to prevail to you. Because these are, of course, when C is equal to C prime, it is a very subtle point. Now let's comfort ourselves a little bit. Instead of these abstract uh, notation, let's go to the well-known, the most well-known so continuous spectrum entity, which is the position operator. Position operator is associated with the location of the object, right? And uh, from if you carry over from classical physics, you know, uh, location. You have a reference system, a la Mr. Descartes, <coughs> and you measure everything with respect to the origin of that coordinate frame, hoping that every, eventually you have a universal inertial frame somewhere sitting at the center of our universe, right, or at the galaxy or something. And then you measure everything with respect to that absolute frame. So it's an important thing, position operator. In the, for, for example, in the realm of general relativity, matter and coordinate go hand in hand. You know, they are so much intermingled. So they become sort of dynamical. Here, they are not dynamical. They just set the, the reference. However, we talk about the position operator. Although it gives us a frame that we can measure everything, eventually when we associate the operator for this, it is a bit 
when you think of it, you can, there is room for philosophizing, okay? So that's the position operator. So we define, I use this capital X for the association. Let's stick to one dimension for the time being. Eventually we'll move to a three-dimensional space. I define this eigenvalue problem accordingly. The little x's are eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And when I use the capital notation, it's comfortable to do it that way. You can distinguish operators and numbers without putting OP, such funny labels. Eh? That is the uh, position operator. So we postulate that we postulate <coughs> x still I use that uh, set, although it's not discrete, I, I don't have a better notation to represent this. We say it is comp orthonormal a la Dirac delta and complete. And people like von Neumann at the time, at the advent, during the advent of quantum theory, when he has written that beautiful quantum mechanics book, Mathematical Foundations, I don't know whether anybody has really managed to go through the book. There are all these mathematical theorems, putting all these in sound mathematical basis. But anyway, I prefer to follow Mr. Zakrai, and I say they form a complete set. And orthonormality is in this, uh, the Dirac sense. If it forms a complete set, sounds like a trivial sentence in plain English, but when you think of it at the foundational level a la von Neumann, it's not a trivial matter, particularly this completeness. But anyway, we postulate it and we pursue to the limits till anybody gets any inconsistency. Nobody has gotten any inconsistency vis-a-vis. So then any arbitrary state vector in this now infinite dimensional Hilbert space, this entity <laughs> live in this infinite dimensional Hilbert space because there are infinitely many, uncountably many, however complete. You insert the identity. By the way, here I can express, perhaps I should express again, although it is a repetition of those things in the abstract language, orthonormality of the eigenvectors of the position operators defined as such, and completeness is defined as such. So I insert this identity here, and I get dx. Here are the basis vectors, that's the summation, and these are the coordinates. As I said, you may wish to call it as alpha of x, as psi of x, and it, it, it may also contain a t, but we are not <coughs> paying too much attention to it. <coughs> now, uh, obviously from this very definition, we can <clears throat> attribute a meaning to this one. What is the meaning of this? <coughs> Alpha is the physical state vector, and when we write it in the position eigenvector basis, obviously we are trying to make a position measurement. Whatever observed basis you are using, remember this Stengerla? We are using uh, Stengerla measurement for spin measurements, right? Because in the, it splits. So we are carrying us position measurements. That is the probability of finding this particular value of x out of infinitely many. That's the amplitude of finding that position when we carry out a position measurement. And this is the probability of it, when you take the mod square of the amplitude. And if you can put a dx in that dx interval, you can keep that dx interval as small as possible. That's infinitesimal, right, in the sense of infinitesimal calculus. That is the probability of finding the object at the dx interval at the position x. 
If so, then you are in a one-dimensional world, then what is the total probability of finding that object somewhere along that minus infinity, plus infinity axis? It's going to be somewhere in there. Here, there, or there, or there. 100% probability of finding it somewhere along that interval. So I have to sum over those options to get one. That is the normalization, right? And is it really equivalent to saying that the alpha we have started with was a normalized state vector in this infinite dimensional abstract Hilbert space? Yes, that is really equivalent to saying that and a demonstration is easy because that's the inner product of this vector, right? And then you write it in the symbolic fashion. Claim that this is one normalized and that is the implication of it in the coordinate language. Proof is very easy. Let's start with the right hand side and let's show that that indeed implies that the integral of those coordinate mod squares is one over integrated over all entire linear space. So what is this then? Alpha alpha insert here a completeness sum That's one. So integral dx alpha x x alpha. Write it as x alpha squared. So this becomes x alpha mod squared. So this is the integral of x alpha squared. So indeed. Finding the object to have the x position, to have the value of x and its mod square is probability integrated overall gives you one equivalent to saying that alpha in the, that state vector in the abstract Hilbert space is normalized to unity. So we talk about only those type of state vectors to have a probabilistic interpretation, right? Copenhagen interpretation of the quantum theory. Now if we extend this <coughs> to three dimensions, Here x was a single, we were living on a line, a one dimensional world, from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now we go to a three dimensional vector, which we tend to represent x1, x2, x3, and some people may wish to call them in the a la carte in x, y, z. They are all the same. Anyway, whichever is your favorite, use it. I will use them interchangeably. And Mr. Uh, Sakurai uses for uh, two lines, x, y, z, Cartesian, and then he shifts to x1, x2, x3, because it's easy. Then you can introduce index notation, right? This is xi. i takes one, two, three values, so it is xi, really. This is, you have to repeat. Whatever you have done for x, you have to repeat for the y and z. So that's pedantic. It may be more uh, familiar from, for your, from your previous classes, but stick to this one, okay? Yeah, so, so that's a much better notation. So we, <coughs> first of all, we do the following. We claim, claim x1, x2, x3 are a common eigenstate which we will denote as x, a common eigenstate of the operators x1 now remember I promised to use 
the capitals for the operators. So there are these x1 operator, x2 operator, x3 operator, and they are the common eigenstates. Therefore, what do I mean? xi, xi, if you want, three of them together. Yeah, so it's not a single one, the one dimensional. That's perhaps more comfortable. Meaning, this, whatever this component operator is, it is the same uh, eigenvalue, but this is a, a tree-label <coughs> eigenvector. Okay, whichever is this, it picks it from there. So now, as uh, we, in order to be able to talk about the simultaneous set of, simultaneous eigen eigenket for a set of operators, obvi obviously, it means that these three components commute among each other. Now think of it. We sort of take it as a sort of trivial and easy to accept statement that the three components of the operator should commute among each other and we can freely determine without disturbing any information previously, we can simultaneously measure the three position operators. That's the meaning of it, right? If they commute among themselves, then according to the <coughs> theorem that we have seen before, they can, simulta they can be simultaneously diagonalized. Therefore, we can independently measure any of them without spoiling the information. For example, if you measure the x1 first, find a value x1 and then we carried out another measurement and measured x2 and found x2 and then we go back again measure x1 I will still get the x1 that's a beautiful following Stengerla right take again x1 measure and I claim that x1 will be covered that's <coughs> he doesn't say much there is some I don't want to call it a postulate but if we can really if we can have a reference frame obviously that's so natural that we should be able to measure these three components together otherwise we wouldn't be even be able to talk about a three-dimensional world right if we cannot measure if we cannot define a three-dimensional axis and three-dimensional <coughs> space measurements. I would have been more comfortable if you have put sort of a small statement saying that it is a very, very easily acceptable, you know, deep grounded postulate, but we say that they can be measured simultaneously. <coughs> You see, I feel a bit uncomfortable about this. Reason is the following. When we go to momentum, in classical physics, let me go back to the original definition of state in classical physics. Allah, Allah Newton or Lagrange or Hamilton, whichever version of it, it doesn't matter. You, you stick to your own favorite version. State is defined as a collection of position and momenta for each degree of freedom. So if you have a single free particle in the three-dimensional world, which has three positions and three momenta, so you have a collection of six numbers to define the state and to, to be able to predict all the positions and the state of motion in the future. That's the causality. And that deterministically, you should be able to de define all the answers. There, of course, as the measurements are 
undisturbing measurements, there was no question of that sort. Even X and P together, let alone three X's or three B's, P's. So I don't feel comfortable myself and I would like to challenge your minds to think of even this commut commutativity of the three different position operators taken granted so automatically, so lightheartedly. Do a bit of reading and thinking on your own, okay? But here, obviously, when we go to quantum mechanics, X and P are separate things, different things, not, they do not commute, therefore we cannot use the six of them together as a package. We have to chop off the half, either stick to the three position operators or three position eigenvalues or three position labels, each being infinitely, infinite dimensional continuous. So there is a continuum of x1 or continuum of x2, continuum of x3 or vice versa for the p's, but anyway. X is a obscure operator. It will be more clear when you eventually you move into the field of quantum the field theory. For example, you'll realize that there doesn't exist a proper definition. Everyone has their own the definition of position operator. There is not a well-accepted common definition of position operator. And when you really think of it, you say, of course, position operator is a strange thing. Momentum operator is beautiful, as I will demonstrate. Momentum operator, I'm trying to spend some time because it's a huge subject. I will start next week. Momentum operator will, we will recognize as the generator of the translations in space. That has a well-defined meaning because we know that there are symmetries and conservation laws at the heart of the physics, the modern physics. There are symmetries and there are conservation laws. Symmetry means some laws or some uh, entities stay unchanged under a set of operations. For instance, if I, my system is in this reference frame, I can think of going to another reference frame, say, Hacettepe University and Metu. You carry out physics, some experiments. Locations are changed. You have shifted, translated from here, there, or vice versa. You carry out physics. You get whatever you do, you repeat same measurement there or here, you get the same results because laws of physics are invariant under translations in space. That's the symmetry of the laws. Is there a conserved quantity associated with this? Yes, momentum operator is the conserved quantity under this symmetry. We will try to look at everything from this perspective. There is a symmetry and there is a conservation law. X and P are conjugate, cousins, right, in classical mechanics. Even in classical mechanics, momentum has the same interpretation used in the Poisson bracket formalism. You, the, if there is a translation symmetry, there is. Newton's equations or Lagrange equations are invariant under translation from one space position to another. And classical mechanics, momentum is a conserved dynamical quantity. It's a cyclic variable, right? That's how you express it in the context of classical mechanics. So in this sense, there is a strong, a beautiful analogy between classical and quantum. And momentum plays a very beautiful role. Can you find anything associated with the position operator of that sort? Position operator is not a conserved quantity and there is no symmetry associated with that. And you may wonder, as once Mr. Uh, who was that discoverer of the NMR? I forgot the name. Who ordered this? There's some theological implications associated with this. Then you have a new thing, a new conservation law, a new quantum number. You say, who ordered this? It's an odd man out. There is no natural place for position operator and position things, really. Momentum is a beautiful interpretation. It's a generator of the translation. It's concert quantity associated with the translation symmetry. The best we can say following Mr. Feynman, the great Feynman, vis-a-vis -vis the position is that laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. Inertial frames, either according to Mr. Galileo or Mr. Einstein, are those frames which move with constant speed. Are there any symmetry associated with this? 
any conservation law. That's a beautiful symmetry. Laws of physics are the same under constantly moving reference frames, but there is no conserved quantity associated with that. And in a sense, position operator is distinctly related with those inertial frames, their, their locations, their relatives standing. Anyway, position operator is something uh, you should feel uncomfortable about. And that's a, not such a very weak statement that different components commute among each other so I can freely measure simultaneously all the three components without interfering with each other, without losing any information. The rest is easy. I will feel more comfortable when we talk about the momentum and its physical interpretation next week.